my eyes have seen your glory. Before I jump into my sermon, I want to um, <coughs> respond to Gail's comments a little bit. Here, I thought you all came from my great hairstyle. Gail, did you, did you write that in or is that what was really there? That was really there, okay. I thought it was my fine wardrobe and flashy hair that... Um, I just want to say, um, and I'm going to try to do this without blubbering. I blubber whenever I talk about things that matter to me. Um, but this, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to serve here. And this church came along at a time in my life um, when I needed you. <laughs> and it's great to serve together. Um, grateful for all the things that you allow me to do and all the ways that you care uh, for me and for my family so well. And... Um, uh, can't can't believe can't believe that God has worked it out that we get to worship and serve together and, I, and I'm very thankful for that and just want to take this moment to uh, to express that um, I'm going to be 58 in just a few weeks so I've been thinking about church uh, this week and realized that I have been to church almost 2,800 times. That's a lot of church, and, and some of you have, uh, are way out ahead of me on that. Uh, my parents told me that they took me to church when I was two weeks old, um, and, and took me to church pretty much every Sunday after that. The family that I grew up in, it was never a matter of waking up and saying, okay, is to, are, are we going to go to church today? It was just an assumption that that's what Sundays were, and that that's what we would do as a family, and I don't say that as a matter of pride because I had nothing to do with that decision, um, but I'm, I'm grateful for it, and I'm, I'm grateful to my parents, um, and what I didn't know at the time is that my parents were exposing me to a tradition that went all the way back to the very first churches in the New Testament. And as we pause uh, together in kind of the, the teaching life of our church between series, I thought I would take a couple of weeks and talk about church, what church is. Um, shortly after the, the resurrection, Christians started meeting every Sunday for worship. And a typical worship service, they probably met in the evening instead of the morning. Uh, they, they would share a meal together. They would read scripture together. They would receive teaching together. They would sing together and pray together. Uh, sh very shortly after the church was founded, they began taking up offerings together and sending the money to needier parts of the church. Um, but that's what the church was. And it was referred to not as Christianity or anything really fancy, but it was just called the way. You part of the way? Uh, the way were people who believed in Jesus and met together to, to worship. Uh, and looking at church history, we don't actually find church buildings until about 100 years after the New Testament was completed. And that's important because it reminds us, even, even on a very local level, that this building is not the church. This building is where one part of the church gathers to worship. The church is God's people. And the purpose of the church is to be a blessing to the entire world. It's a place where we gather and we express our worship to the Lord, but it's also a place where as the Lord makes us more like Jesus, we bless those who are around us. And since church is so important, I'm going to take two Sundays to talk about what a New Testament church is. What do we learn from the New Testament about church? The word church is related to two different Greek words. And the first Greek word is a word called ekklesia. And ekklesia is a Greek word that had a general meaning, and then it, over time it developed a very specific meaning. And the, the, the general meaning of the word ekklesia was an assembly people who assemble together. And it wasn't just any assembly, but it was an assembly of people who had been summoned by the king. That's what ecclesia was. The king would issue a summons and say, I want everyone to get together to hear what I have to say, and that was ecclesia. And then over time, it, it developed a more specific meaning, and that referring to the people who were meeting to worship Christ. It's literally a combination of two words. Ecclesia is a combination of called and out from. 
So church is a group of people who have been called out from the world in general to gather together and to worship. The English word for church that we use today is an adaptation of a different Greek word, the word uh, kareikos, and this word only occurs two times in the New Testament, and it's never translated church. But the word church, if you look at church and this Greek word kareikos, they, they sort of look together, and church was an adaptation of some of the sounds that were in that word. And I want you to, and again, this, this is two times in the Bible, never translated as church. I want you to listen closely to the two passages where this word occurs and see if you can figure out which word it is from which we end up getting this, this word church. 1 Corinthians 11, 20. Uh, and this is a passage where Paul is actually confronting the church uh, because they were not behaving well when they came together to take communion. They were rushing in and some were gorging themselves and others weren't getting any food and he's kind of calling them to task, but the word occurs in this passage. Paul says, so then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Well, where in there do you see church? Let me read the other passage. This is Revelations 1, verse 10. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Hmm. Do you see the word church in there anywhere? Well, what word do you see in both of those, in both of those verses? The, the word that pops up in both of those churches is the word Lord's, the possessive form of the word Lord. And as I explored uh, this New Testament word for church, both of these words, I learned something that really surprised me. In the Gospels, Jesus says almost nothing about church. There's actually only one place where he uses the word to refer to church. There are two places where he uses the word, but in only one of them does he use it to refer to what we would think of as the church today, and it's this passage in Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 13 to 18. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, well, some people say, some people say this, uh, John the Baptist. Others say uh, Elijah. Uh, still others think that uh, the Son of Man is Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So they're asking, he's, Jesus is asking, who do, you think that I, who do you think that I am? And they're saying, well, maybe, maybe you're, you're John the Baptist appearing at, or Elijah or one of these other people. But what about you, he said, who do you think that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you, Peter, and I, uh, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. So according to Jesus, the church is going to be an assembly of people who are called out to believe, like Peter did, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Put all that together and you get the big idea for today's uh, message. The church consists of people who belong to the Lord, people who have been called out to meet together, and people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That's what church is. We've responded to a summons from the king to get together and to assemble. We assemble together because we all belong to the Lord. And we assemble with the purpose of living out our belief that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. It's interesting. I've always been interested in looking at conversions in the New Testament and looking at every time that a person becomes a Christian and, and looking for a theme. And what you see is that whenever there's a conversion in the New Testament, you generally see five things. Uh, some passages put more of an emphasis on a couple of these than others, but generally speaking, all of these will show up. And the five that you see are belief, uh, repentance, a baptism, a joining a church, and doing good works. Jesus' uh, own brother, it seems like we've been talking about him a lot lately, James. Uh, James said that faith that doesn't produce good works is dead faith. 
In other words, if you say you believe something, it doesn't change what you do and how you spend your life and doing good works for others, then that's not really saving, that, that he doesn't really say what that is, but that's not true faith that saves people. True faith leads to good, to good works. And I think it's important that I try to talk, when I talk about true conversion, not just about becoming a Christian, but about being a Christian. I think that a person becomes a Christian when they believe in Jesus Christ and repent. But I think that as you study the lives of people who experience true conversion, after they believe and repent, they connect with the church, they get baptized, and they start serving the people who are around them. This is a New Testament formula for entering the kingdom of heaven or becoming and being a Christian. So Jesus never talked about becoming a Christian. What Jesus talked about was entering the kingdom of heaven. And then Paul comes along afterwards, and Paul talks about getting saved and joining the church, and those are, the two, those are two versions of the same thing. Two ways of talking about coming into a relationship with God and becoming a part of what he is doing in initiating this new kingdom of heaven. So one thing that's interesting about looking at this formula is that nowhere in the New Testament is there an example of a Christian who does not go to church. It's a key part of how we live out and grow in our faith, and it's so important that the author of Hebrews wrote this. This is Hebrews 10, verses 24 to 25. Let us consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So here you see this, the good deeds, right? We see these good works. How can we, let us think about this. How can we spur one another on to love people and to do good deeds? And then he says, uh, by not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. So church is where we gather together and we encourage each other. It's where we spur one another on to be people who love God and love our neighbors and to do good, to do good works. So what I want to, next week what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, how the New Testament describes church and some aspects of how good churches function. Today what I want to do is I want to talk about six ways that the New Testament church was radically different than anything else in the world. So when you think about the church growing, it's really kind of hard to even wrap your head around, but the fact that, 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 that uh, on one occasion, the, the person who is the leader of this movement uh, is, is put to death in a horrible fashion. It would seem that the way had been stamped out, um, and yet within several centuries, the church had spread to all across Europe and, and northern Africa. How, how, did all of that, how did all of that happen? Well, one thing that contributed to it was just how radically different it was than anything else that existed, and the difference in the church caught people's attention attention, and it convinced people something genuine is happening here. Something authentic is happening here, and I want to be a part of it. What are some of those things? Here's the first thing that stood out about this new radical movement called the church. It was racially and ethnically diverse. And some of you are probably saying, oh, okay, here we go. Pastor Carl's being politically correct again. Uh, now, this is the teaching of Scripture. And, and Scripture is very clear about this being something that was radical and new. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to um, 13 reads like this. Just as one body, uh, though one, has many parts, um, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For all of us were baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles. This was radically different, radically new. Every other form of religion revolved around someone's nationality or their ethnicity. And, and there was a, a clear wall of separation between it. I was doing some research this week on what it was like at the time of Christ. And in the temple, they actually had, there, there were, there were a, a series of courts getting closer and closer to the Holy of Holies. And the very outer court of the temple was actually called the Court of Gentiles. And, and the just only part of the, of, the, of the temple where Gentiles were allowed to be, and they were allowed to be there because they, they served a business function. They were, they were providing animal sacrifice, they sold animals, 
for sacrifice. There was some marketing that was done out there. So there's this, there's this court of, so it's kind of like if we were practicing that model today, we would say, well, only, only people of a certain nationality or of a certain ethnicity are allowed to worship with us, and people who are not a part of that group have to meet in the pavilion out back of the parking lot. That, that's, where, that's where they can stay. And this was, and this, to, to, to give you a sense of how important this was, is if a Gentile strayed out of the court of Gentiles into another part of the temple, Rome uh, had the authority, uh, as, as requested by the Jews, to execute them. So you could be executed if you were not a part of the in-group, if you're not a part of the in-nationality or the in-ethnicity, the Jews, you could be executed for wandering into the wrong part of the temple. And then the church comes along and, and, and everyone is, is included. Ephesians 2 verse 12 says, remember that at one time you were separate from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel. So Israel was the place where God met with the people. That was as God's way of interacting with humanity. And at one time, you were excluded. You were foreigners to the covenant and to the promises. So in other words, the promises that are available to everyone else, they're not available to you. You were a foreigner to all that. You were without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So in the church, those who could have been executed because of their race and ethnicity, um, they were not considered uh, equal to their Jewish brothers. In the church, all of a sudden, they are worshiping side by side. They hold positions of, of leadership. There's no distinction between the two. And it's not just, um, it wasn't just uh, respectable Jewish people and Jewish looking Gentiles who got to meet together. I was, there's another verse that, that gives us a hint as to the kind of, of diversity that exists. Colossians 3.11 Here in the church, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised. That's just saying the same things. It's a way of distinguishing between Gentiles and Jews. Um, here in the church there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, but Christ is all and in all. So I, my mind wanders. My mind goes off on tangents. And when I'm, when I'm studying the scripture, sometimes a word will pop up or an idea will pop up, and I'll think, man, I wonder what that's about. So that happened as I was working on the message this week. I thought, hmm, I wonder who the Scythians were. I've never really looked into that group of people. Um, so I did a little bit of research, and I think we have a picture coming up here. This is a Scythian. And the Scythians were interesting people. They were, uh, so, so in the passage, what's happening there in that passage is it talks about barbarians and Scythians. Barbarians was a word that was kind of applied to foreigners in general. So I guess, foreigners in general were a bunch of barbarians. Um, and, and the Scythians were a group within that group and the, the Scythians were fierce warriors. And they were a nomadic group. They, they, they were known for their horsemanship and for being very fierce warriors. They were nomadic. Uh, here's how the Greek historian um, wrote about the Scythians shortly before the time of Christ. He's describing this group of people who now, uh, in the New Testament, are part of the church. These are our fellow church members. So what are these people like? Um, none who attack them can ever escape, and none can catch them if they desire not to be found. The Scythians had developed a highly sophisticated bow and arrow. So they, they, they combined wood and they made these bows that were much more powerful than what anyone else had. And they would dip the tips of their arrows in poison and if they were attacking, they would send thousands of these arrows down upon the people they were up against. So these are fierce, nasty, angry, aggressive people. And not only that, it gets even worse. They were also heavily tattooed. So some, you're supposed to laugh a little bit more than that. Uh, but they, they found, they found uh, remains of these Scythians, and they had like the coolest set of tattoos ever. Like they had sleeves on both arms and up their legs, and really or, ornate tattoos, and they liked a lot of bling. They had a lot of, of jewelry. And here's one of the things that I thought was most interesting about this group of the, the Scythians. They liked to get drunk and get high. 
so these were, they had a thing for alcohol, and they are the first stoners. Um, this is the first group ever known to get high on marijuana. Who would have, who, you don't get this stuff at other churches in town. You only get this kind of information here at Central. Um, but here, um, here's what another historian wrote. The Scythians then take the seed of this hemp and creeping under their mats, they throw it on the red hot stones and so being thrown, it smolders and it sends forth so much steam that no Greek vapor bath could surpass it. And then the Scythians howl in their joy at their vapor baths. So this is basically like a motorcycle gang showing up at church. <laughs> And, and in the New Testament church, they were welcomed. And they worshipped side by side with the most respectable Jewish people available, the people who were the in, the in people, but they were welcomed and they, and they were equal. There was no distinction in status between these converted motorcycle gang type people and, and the people who had respectable positions in, in society. Um, and so then the next thing we learn is that slaves had equal status with the rich. So in, in, in Judean culture, the assumption among Jews was that wealth and righteousness were related. That, that if a person was wealthy, they were righteous. If they were poor, they're probably poor because they were not righteous. And, and the New Testament undoes that. If you read a little further in the First Corinthians passage that I just read, it says, For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. So slaves and their owners worship side by side within the church with no difference in status. Galatians 3, 26 to 28. So in Christ, you are all children of God through faith. Um, for all of you were baptized into Christ. You've clothed yourself with Jesus. There is no Jew nor Gentile. There is no slave nor free. So imagine that, that in that culture... Uh, six days of the week, there's this, there's this big distinction between those who own the slaves and those who are the slaves. But in the life of the church, that difference disappears. And slaves have equal status with the people who could have been their, their owners. Matter of fact, I learned that in the early church, it was, very, uh, it was very common for the church to take up offerings and buy freedom for people who had been in slavery. So if someone came to Christ who was a slave, the people in the church would gather their funds and they'd go to the person who owned that slave and they would purchase their freedom. There's an entire book in the New Testament called Philemon about a, a slave um, who escaped from his owner, uh, comes to Christ, becomes a Christian, and ends up ministering to Paul. And the entire book of Philemon is a letter that the apostle Paul writes to a guy named uh, Philemon, the slave is Onesimus, and he, he writes to Philemon and says, hey, Philemon, uh, Onesimus has come to Christ. He is a great help to me in the ministry. I know that I could just kind of tell you that you have to do this, but I'm going to ask you, would, would you be willing to grant Onesimus his freedom so that he can serve me in the ministry here? And we don't know the rest of that story, but we're assuming that that, that took place. But here in the church, uh, slaves have equal status with, the, with their owners. And at that time in early history. I read this, this was kind of surprising me, but a third of the Greco-Roman population lived in slavery. A third of the population were slaves at this time in that, in that particular part of the, the world. Uh, Clement, one of the early church fathers uh, who came along, uh, I think about 100 years after the church, wrote this, slaves are men like ourselves. And another church father added, slaves are not slaves to us. We deem them brothers after the spirit, in religion, fellow servants. This is radically different than anything else. And it's part of what got people's attention and caused people to think, hey, this is, this is something real. This isn't, just, this isn't just like going through the motions of righteousness. Something radical is happening on here. That we would love one another in this way that eliminates these, these dis distinctions.
So not only, um, in, in Paul's writing, not only are the distinctions based on race and economic status and slavery gone, he also says that in the church, uh, differences in status based on gender disappeared. So that women had equal status with men. Galatians 3, 27 to 28, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. One commentary that I read said, in the first century Roman world and in Judaism, it was well documented that women were regarded as second class citizens. So remember I was talking to you about the court of Gentiles in the temple, where it's the only part of the temple where Gentiles were allowed to be. If they wandered into another part of the temple, they could be executed. Well, just inside the court of the Gentiles was another court, and it was called the court of women. And women could only go so far into the temple, and then they could go no further. So you, you go further into the temple, you get closer and closer to where worship is happening, and women were excluded from that. Women couldn't vote. Women couldn't testify in a court of law. Women were seldom addressed directly. They kind of stayed in the background, and Jesus was scandalous because he addressed women directly. And he addressed women of, of all reputations and all statuses, and he addressed them kindly. And, and people would actually confront him and say, why, why are you talking to that person? Why are you talking, why are you taking time to talk to that, that woman who is also a Samaritan? And, and those differences in status disappear with Jesus. Because in, in Jesus' economy and, and in the church, what matters is that we bear the image of God, and all people bear that. And these differences in status and in value disappear in the church. It's also interesting, um, if, you, if you watch the New Testament, um, and, and you, if you study the life of Jesus, women are always there. They're in the inner circle of people who are traveling with Jesus, and they have positions <clears throat> of influence. Matter of fact, it's, it's, we'll talk about this when we get closer to Easter. But it's shocking that the first witnesses of the resurrection were women. When in a court of law at that time, a woman's testimony would have no, would have no bearing at all. So a woman couldn't be a witness in a court of law, but the, wit the, first, the initial witnesses to the resurrection were women. So we see that, that distinction in status where men are way up here and women are way down here, that's gone in the church. And in the church, all have equal value. The other thing that was radically different about the church is in the church, people had direct access to God. Before the church came along, the church, by the way, was established at Pentecost. Um, 50, it was 50 days after the resurrection, uh, after Christ had ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit comes down, and, and people speak in tongues, and, and that, is, that is, most people would say, that is, the, that is the day the church was born, was when that, when that happened. But prior to that happening, there were all these elaborate rituals you had to go through in order to have any access to God. There were cleansing rituals, there were dietary rituals, um, you had to go to certain places, you had to interact with certain people, and, and there, there's, there's this elaborate way in which we would have access to God, um, and only the, only the, only the uh, very, very few uh, got to the point where they really had like direct, could, could address God directly, and all of that goes away in the church. In the church of Jesus Christ, we have direct access to the God who created the universe. And that was radically, radically different. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all people, this has now been witnessed to at the proper time, and for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, but I am a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Paul's main task, if you look at the New Testament history, 
Peter's main uh, task was focusing on, on, on ministry and mission, trying to convert Jewish people to faith in Jesus Christ. Paul's main call was to take the gospel to non-Jewish people. And Paul, is, Paul here is saying, in this new way of God interacting with people in the church, well, there's only one mediator. There's no hierarchy. There's no high priest. Um, the only mediator we have is Jesus Christ. And he calls us to be his brothers and his sisters and interact with God directly. Second thing, that was, next thing that was radically different about the church is that instead of many sacrifices, there was one sacrifice. So prior to the church being born, there were all of these different sacrifices that were offered at different times of the year. And you'd have to go to certain places and over and over, and you do this over and over and over again. So you, you'd come to uh, uh, a festival one time a year and you'd offer a sacrifice and you'd, you'd pray for forgiveness and a year later you'd have to do it again and again and again and again. And there were sacrifices for all kinds of different things. But in the church, all of that disappears. Hebrews chapter 10 says, day after day, Every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of God. For by one sacrifice he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sinless and lawless acts I will remember no more. For where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. So in this church, this radically new organization that takes, takes the world by, by storm, people have direct access to God. Uh, many sacrifices are replaced by the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the last observation about what made the church so different is instead of a high priest, we are all priests. So prior to Jesus, there was this elaborate, uh, elaborate religious structure where you have high priests and you have groups of priests under that and there are thousands and thousands of priests and these thousands and thousands of people under the high priest are, are negotiating our interaction with God and making it possible for us to come to God and to act for, for forgiveness. And you've got to go through all of these different priests. And in the church, this radically new organization, uh, here's what Peter wrote. But you are a chosen people. You... Members of the church are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Hierarchies of status have no place in the church. We are on level ground. Uh, pastors, and elders, and deacons, and worshipers on level ground at the foot of the cross serving Christ together. Let me say a word of prayer as our praise band uh, comes, gets ready to close our service with song. Father, I thank you uh, for today. I thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to think about what church is, what it is that we're participating in today. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be reminded that this Sunday, as we gather in worship, we are participating in something that goes all the way back to Pentecost. All the way back to time shortly after the resurrection, Christians have been meeting on Sundays, uh, lifting our voices in song, praising you, reading the scriptures, uh, gathering offerings, equipping ourselves to do good works. Father, I help, help us to live up to that legacy. Father, I pray that you would help us to, to do church in a way that would be attractive, that would draw people to Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would use our participation in church to equip us for good works. Um, Lord, I pray that even this week, I pray that we would go out and, and, and do things that are a reflection of our devotion to Jesus Christ and our love for our neighbors, and we ask this in Jesus' precious name, amen. Whatever is, uh, is going on in your life this week, uh, leave leaning on the everlasting arms of a God who loves you.
God who loves you so much that he sent his son to die, to conquer death, and to, to, walk, to, to make it possible for us to be adopted as God's uh, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters in Christ. If you would like to learn a little bit more about Central and have thought about joining the church, there's a meeting that will start uh, at about noon um, in the prayer chapel right over here. Uh, this is not a commitment to join the church. It's just attending a meeting to learn a little bit more. So if this is your first Sunday here and you'd like to learn a little bit more, or if you've been coming for a while, we would, we would love to have you. Um, again, next week, uh, we'd, we'd like to ask uh, some of our folks to come prepared to move some brush. That's for a playground that we're building on this side of our church. We'll need some help right after church next week, so be thinking about that. Remember to be praying for uh, for Vito uh, and for Chris Wright today. And let me say a prayer as we uh, leave together. Father, um, Lord, I thank you for those who are here today. And I, Lord, I pronounce a blessing on them and just, um, Lord, we thank you for the work of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And I pray that your favor would rest on those who are worshiping here today. Father, we give ourselves back to you. We, Lord, we recognize that all that we have is from you, but today we give ourselves back to you, um, offering ourselves to you as, as living sacrifices. Lord, help us to live for you, to live for the gospel, and to live for the kingdom of heaven this week. And we ask this in Jesus' uh, precious and beautiful name. Amen. My eyes have seen your glory, Lord.